Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, I'm Ken Baiba, and I thought today I would share some of my thoughts about the current state of the art of 3D printing, um, kind of what's possible and what's not possible with a focus on high power rockets, and share with you, I think I got six projects in here that range from H motors to M motors, actually P motors, to uh, illustrate uh, the capabilities and range of opportunities I think we have in using 3D printing to kind of revolutionize what we do in um, high power rocketry. Um, I will not have the ability to uh, do chat or answer questions during the presentation, but um, please uh, take the opportunity to chat among yourselves in the chat room and, um, and ask questions using the Q and A uh, tablet uh, over on the far right. And uh, when I stop pitching, I will return to questions. So let me, with that, let me start. So um, I'm going to try to present today my assertion that we see it. 3D printing is an opportunity and a revolution for amateur rocketry. And that furthermore, there is no going back. Uh, yes, we'll always still build rockets out of cardboard and plywood, but um, our kids won't and our grandkids won't. So who am I, just for those who, who, who have uh, forgotten me? I wanted to be an astronaut, but in those days, in the 60s, 50s, I wasn't a fighter pilot. So clearly I wasn't going to be one. So I needed to think about ways my robots needed to explore for me. I ended up being a physicist, computer scientist, or an entrepreneur. Um, if you use Wi-Fi or cable modems or rely on computer security, I touched a bunch of those things during my professional career. And I now have lucky, lucky enough to have 30 years in amateur rocketry, ham, TRA, level three a bit. Been on more boards than I know what to do with. Ultimate records have my own satellite orbit and for Arliss, SLI, TARP, SA Cup, and for individuals. My point of view, and for those of you who have met me, uh, know that I certainly have points of view. I believe we generally overbuild our amateur rockets. Uh, we don't really understand how they work in terms of strength of materials and stresses of flight. We don't understand the temperatures that they're going through. And so therefore we build the strongest thing we can. We Carbon looks pretty, so we build things out of carbon. And uh, I think that, that lack of understanding uh, limits us in terms of understanding the best things we can build. Um, one of the lessons I came out about the software business, and I think SpaceX demonstrates kind of just every day these days, is that rapid iterative design is a good thing. And my assertion is that what 3D printing does is allow us to make the same tools we use for software in terms of agile, rapid development uh, for uh, rocketry hardware. Uh, many of our children and grandchildren, anybody that is mentoring a TARC team knows that those high school kids, almost every one of them has access to a 3D printer. I know for all my teams, they're all building their rockets uh, using 3D printed parts. And it fundamentally changes how we build and buy things. When you have to design your parts yourself, you understand much more how they work. So there's really an opportunity to be much more conscious and intentional about rocketry and about physics. And I think we'll hopefully demonstrate that 3D printing works for many amateur rocketry components, um, not all at the very high end. Um, and I would argue to you to, uh, uh, surrender to the inevitable, uh, join, join the team and embrace and extend and use 3D printing in your own projects. So the que question I always asked is why bother? And I, the first thing that impresses me is that you can build impossible things. So I found this picture of me much younger, 15 years ago, holding a project I had done. Those of you who know what an Arliss rocket is, it's basically the same rocket that's flown often in SLI competitions, certainly in the um, SA Cup 10K competition. It's basically a six-inch frame, holds generally a 
or probably a uh, 98 millimeter motor mount, uh, has a uh, payload bay for deploying a payload. And uh, I'd flown those for a bunch of years. And um, I was curious about could I make it better? And so this is uh, my first attempt 15 years ago to make it better by first of all, recognizing that these are subsonic rockets. So the, the no pointed nose cone shapes generally are a poor idea. And so I changed the nose cone shape to give less aerodynamic drag. And um, surface area generally tends to be the biggest cause of drag. And so I packed together a minimum diameter booster I had uh, together. And so this cost me a fair amount of money to build because it's all fiberglass parts, right? And um, uh, it worked. So I flew this. But generally, uh, uh, an Arliss flies to about 10K feet on an M1419. This on a 1419 flew to about 16K, largely because it weighs less and it has less drag. Now, building this is not a trivial activity. You got to build standoffs. I had standoffs that were vacuum to uh, enable launch off a rail. And it's not particularly pretty. Um, this is what I've just finished building, and I'll talk about project later. This is a six inch nose count that deploys a 2U CubeSat printed out of Tech G. And uh, it, it basically does the same thing as all the red part you saw on the previous slide. Um, yet, it actually does more because, well, it does, there's the ab bay down in the bottom part in the transition there as well. Um, the cool thing is it costs less to build. So here is the same picture. Here actually is a satellite uh, inside that is um, we're making in collaboration with a uh, high school team to fly on New Shepard. So here is a complete 150 millimeter CubeSat deploying nose cone payload bay, and it cost me about $50 in filament to print. Um, uh, so what did I save? I saved lots of money. Um, I couldn't buy a nose cone for that price at six inches, uh, much less the fiberglass for the ab bay, plus the transition, plus the parts. Uh, so, you know, it's tremendously less expensive. Um, your project will perform better. So because um, I can do customized aerodynamics on this, I can make the right nose cone shape to get a little bit more performance. So it's hard to kind of see, but you can see the nose cone tip over there in the lower right. Um, I changed that from being uh, <coughs> a sphere to a elliptical. To finally, this is a power series. Uh, and uh, I gained another 15% in altitude. Um, so I can now build things that are integrated fin cans. I can, as you can see here, this is assembled with screws. So rather than building a conventional technology of glue and fiberglass, I now can build things that assemble uh, with, with screws. And lastly for me, and I think it's very important, is that we can learn more. Um, I now have the ability to exercise, learn about aerodynamics, to figure about shapes work. I can test those shapes. I can look at strength of materials. I learn more about the mechanics of how all this goes together. And I can integrate all those uh, to get less stupid about building rockets. So let me do a quick 3D printing basics for those of you who ha haven't done them. Uh, one of the key things about 3D printing is the strength of materials, how rigid they are, what the axial strength is, particularly for rockets, and the flexibility, uh, particularly for impact resistance when it lands. And during max Q for having some robustness during a uh, vibration. The other key piece is what's called the glass transition temperature. And it's the piece time the temperature which you begin to get heat deformation of the material. And this is deeply involved in material selection, and we'll talk about this. But one of the pieces that was um, amazing to me was to learn that for many materials that would be accessible to the hobbyist, uh, the heat deformation temperature is roughly the same as the heat deformation, te heat deformation temperature of the epoxy resin we use in fiberglass and carbon airframes. So basically, the heat issue is not 
Um, and then we tune those processes, what we call slicing parameters, in which we translate the shape into instructions to the printer to, uh, to uh, uh, extrude plastic. So here's an example of what we do is FDM printing, fused deposition modeling, which is layers of extruded thermoplastic. Uh, what we're printing here is actually that nose cone tip that I showed you before for the six inch nose cone um, and some, sl uh, and some um, uh, sleeves uh, to do um, to drilling for the um, uh, a fiberglass airframe. Printers precisely squirt melted plastic, generally around two to 300 C. For most of the interesting plastics, the higher temperature is better. So 300, we have a resolution roughly on the order of 500 of a millimeter. And our nozzle diameter is actually printing and extruding the plastic is about 0.4 millimeters. Uh, we have a choice of materials I'll talk a bit. There's now a very robust set of software workflow tools that allow us to go from making shapes to actually extruding plastic in a print. And one of the cool things is, no matter how much you measure, you're off by something. So this demands iterative design. And so the very nature of this is that you do a design, you print it quickly, you try it out, you decide you don't like it, something needs to be better, you quickly iterate and make another one. And the process is so fast that you dramatically improve the quality of your design and the quality of your implementation um, because you can rapidly iterate. Um, I could never do that with the old technologies of uh, fiberglass and uh, carbon. So the basis that we have is strong materials. Uh, we get rid of uh, most of low end printers use something called PLA, which is stiff and has low temperature resistance. Um, it's fine for some parts, say in a tarp rocket, but the real print pr uh, materials we want to use are something called PETG. Uh, there's an enhanced PLA called PLA plus, which has a lot of the properties of ABS, but uh, does not destroy the earth. And I particularly like nylon and polycarbonate. And then at the high end, we can begin to think about something like continue uh, nylon embedded with continuous uh, carbon fiber. That can be along certain axes as strong as aluminum. Uh, we can find flexible materials for making gaskets and seals, uh, TPU. Um, my satellite is down on the bottom there, the, the, one, the cylindrical one on the left and the carrier it was in uh, below, uh, launched off the ISS. Uh, this was printed, um, our prototypes were printed in PLA just to see what it looked like and to do the development. And the final one is printed using laser sintering um, and it's actually space qualified. So this is Leo, this, this got into Leo and sent me a few packets. So the key property properties we wanna look at, I think particularly for HPR, is we need a strong plus flexible and impact resistant. And this is where PETG and PLA plus and nylon are very good and temperature. <coughs> and as good as I mentioned or better, than epoxy resin, which has a melting temperature, a deformation temperature of around 70 degrees C, unless it's aerospace quality. Um, what are our limits? Um, it's a little bit heavier than balsa wood and paper, paper, so at the low end, it's not very interesting, but it is lighter in many ways than fiberglass. So I find my rockets have gone down in weight, which makes they go higher and faster. Um, size, uh, most printers are relatively bounded in size, and for biggish objects, you need to split them in multiple pieces, uh, and then glue either glue or assemble them with screws um, afterwards the printers are getting bigger so your your mileage may vary um, only the best materials are as good as aluminum but most of our rockets don't use aluminum um, but pet g is i enough and you'll see my favorite material and you'll see much of the projects i've been doing are, are in pet g large objects as i mentioned you printed as pieces and assembled Temperature resistance, I think, is largely a solved problem. Um, and time. Uh, this is probably the longest one. These printers are not terribly fast. So printing a largest fin can can take a day. And um, the largest project I'll show you, which is a uh, basically an Arliss rocket, is uh, its nose cone took me three days to print. So this is the 3D printing workflow. You begin with a system design using the tools we all know, open rocket, rock sim, RAS arrow. Uh, you then break that into components, nose cones, tra transitions, uh, recovery bays, 
avionics bays, fincans. And we begin to use tools like TickerCAD. I particularly like it because I'm not particularly a mechanical engineer. And it's, it matches my simple mind as a software engineer. Uh, Fusion 360, I'm trying to teach, learn. I particularly advise you to find OpenSCAD. It's an open uh, 3D printing modeling tool. What the cool thing is, it has libraries built in something of C-like code that allow you to, those libraries construct things like nose cones and uh, transitions. And I urge you, I find all my good stuff off Thingiverse and there's a wide variety of libraries available. I didn't put the list in here, but um, uh, that list I give to my TARP teams and they design their own nose cones, they design their own fin cans, uh, transitions. Uh, it dramatically makes the process of design for individual components really easy. It then goes into a process called slicing, which converts the 3D model into instructions to the printer. Uh, I happen to use a product called Simplify 3D, but the one commonly available is called Cura that will probably come with your printer. And use your printer. Um, I started with the Creality printer, which is with dirt cheap. And I found the printer became the hobby rather than the tool, so I got rid of it. I got a Dremel uh, 3D45, which I really like and highly recommend. My colleague, uh, John Coker, invested in a Mark Forged, uh, which prints uh, continuous carbon fiber with nylon. And we're using that for one of our advanced projects. Um, much more expensive, but not ludicrously expensive. And you then iterate. So once you go through your sample, you can then go back to as many as you can. I often find that I go to through two or three times, unless it's something I really know, uh, to essentially iterate design and the right implementation. So let's go through a set of projects <coughs> of examples, exemplars. Um, to uh, to see what we have. So this this was one of my first high performance projects. I did a 29 millimeter minimum diameter. As you can see, it was optimized for performance. So uh, the pieces that I really built on this was the nose cone and the fin cam. And so the nose cone is a power series nose cone. I have to like power series nose cones. They seem, in terms of my research, they have the lowest drag kind of in the transonic zone from about 0.9 mock to about two mock, mock two which is where many of our projects will live um it's a two-phase deployment it happens to i have some ravens laying around so i use the featherweight raven uh in this design uh fiberglass airplane with uh, airframe with a an aluminum motor retainer and uh if the fin can the recovery uh bulkheads the nose cone the ab bay and uh, First place I prototype a flyaway launch. Uh, my, this is my modification of a flyaway launch design I found on Thingiverse. All printed in PET G, different layers of, uh, of density. Uh, but um, you can now, this looks like it performs anywhere from Mach 0.5 to Mach 1.3, uh, getting going somewhere between 5 and 9K. Um, Second project is scaling this up to a 54 millimeter minimum diameter. And this project is really designed to answer, the, to not only perform, but to kind of answer the question about what, what is the real temperature? So, um, you know, we all fantasize about getting aluminum tips for our nose cones without knowing whether we really need them or not. And so, this is optimized performance as a power series nose cone, as you can see. Uh, an optimized fin cam for supersonic um, in terms of the angle and shape. Uh, it uses uh, Altus Metro, Ptolemy, and Easy plus my particular satellite software, uh, hardware called S4. So all of that gets packaged up in the nose cone. Uh, the S4 is nice because it has I squared C sensors, so I can begin to uh, integrate a nose cone tip thermocouple to. Uh, along with the GPS data that comes off of the Telemega, so I can accurately track the temperature of the tip of the nose cone uh, during flight. Um, it has a standard fiberglass airframe. Airframes are the hardest things, I think, that are going to move to 3D printing because size, volume, uh, not so much strength, 
but size and volume. So fiberglass uh, still works really great for that. And this has a standard aluminum motor retainer. Uh, in this case, the fin can, the recovery bay, nose cone, the ab bay, flyaway launch system are all 3D printed in PET-G. <coughs> this looks like it has performance range of roughly 0.5 Mach to 2.3 Mach under an L935. And the goal here is to fly it till it breaks. And that's still in process. So this changes it to another kind of HPR rather than raw performance. Uh, we're looking at um, payload carrying. So many of you know I have a project called S4, which is based on pocket cubes. Pocket cubes are one eighth of the volume of a standard cube set, so they're uh, five centimeters on a side. And this, and basically, we can package in them an astonishing amount of electronics and, and telemetry so that we can essentially do science experiments. And this is designed for a low-end entry-level payload deployer, uh, either cap buried inside the nose cone or with deployment. The, the design of this particular nose cone allows to put a, a small charge at the bottom of the nose cone. And um, since I can put in either metal or nylon screws, which act like shear pins, I can blow off pieces of the nose cone. Um, it has a fiberglass airframe, the fin can, recovery, motor retainer, payload bay, ab bay, again, are all uh, 3D printed. This happens to be also mounted here on um, a rail launcher that is based on an Amazon music stand and some 3D printed parts, and that works really well. So this performance is all sub mock and the design of the nose cone is uh, design of this whole airframe is designed to maximize altitude and drag uh, sub mock So uh, maximizing drag, minimizing drag is all about minimizing surface area, and uh, that is minimizing nose cone shape and using this kind of uh, almost uh, how shall I say a bowling ball design. By which I like bowling ball designs too. This essentially is the same kind of way of minimizing drag. So on an E30, I can get up to roughly 1,000 feet. And on H125, I can get up to 3,500 feet. So this covers the range of early HP. Now, we can scale that, too, because, again, the nice thing, once you have a design, you can begin scaling. So this scales it using much of the same design and much of the same parts to go to a 54 millimeter airframe. And this carries also the same amount of air, air, uh, pocket cubes, up to three. Um, either captive carry or aptitude deployment, same kind of system, uh, same, and designed in this case, since um, it's not as far, this uses rail standoffs that are 3D printed rather than the flyaway launch loads. And this gets you higher. So rather than going from roughly 1,000 feet to 3,000 feet, this gets us from about 1,500 feet to 9,000 feet on Gs to Ks. So this is roughly equivalent, <coughs> excuse me, to what we would see with a cube, a CANSAT carrier uh, from five to 10,000 feet. Now we get to the big guy. Um, this, uh, you remember that ugly picture of that red and black rocket I started with. This is my view 15 years later of a more optimized design. Uh, uh, the top is modular that it can contain either a 1U CubeSat or a 2U CubeSat. So this is basically the system that you'd use for Arliss, for SLI, or for an SA Cup uh, 10K flight with captive carry and Apogee deployment. Um, it uses a fiberglass airframe with a Luna motor retainer. Uh, the fin can recovery, payload bay, nose cone, ab bay, and flyaway uh, launcher, all 3D printed. And we get this kind of performance going, uh, in this case, it's trans Mach. <clears throat> so we see from roughly Mach 0.8 to about Mach 1.3. Uh, so on a K550, um, it goes to about mile high. And on an M650 or an M685, which are gloriously long burn motors, it gets a bit well above 10K. And on an M1315, it goes to about 11,000. 
Now, why do this? Why not do a why not do a standard Arles type rocket and a fiberglass airframe uh, with plywood fins? Well, it's cooler, I argue. It uh, a lot less expensive. This old what a standard airframe would cost, and probably take shaves maybe about as much as fifty percent off each flight cost because. Because it's aerodynamically more efficient, it needs a smaller motor. So let's say for SLI, uh, uh, flying a 2U CubeSat to 5K feet, um, the K550 is a lot less expensive than a typical L or an M motor used in an SLI airframe. And the other piece, particularly if you think about competitions like SLI and SA Cup, um, the we get to exercise a lot more imagination because it's easier to build and design different designs for the fin cans and the nose cone. We get to exercise more of our in our engineering flexibility. This is to talk about many of you know about our project called Arliss Extreme, which is two stage that we won the Carmack Prize back a bunch of years ago. We've been iterating it, trying to improve it to make it more reliable and more uh, reproducible. Target is now about a 150K. And our goal is to carry up to uh, probably three times of uh, 3X pocket cubes. Um, we think we can actually not just carry them as payload, but Apogee deploy them. So we're, we're looking at that. Uh, as a fiberglass airframe, at these speeds, as a carbon fiberglass vacuum bag fin cans, um, but what we can do is while we can't do the nose cone and the fin can, these are the ab bays printed in uh, PET G. And this is the interstage we're now looking at. Um, we, we, we're really concerned about the interstage and we, um, we lost our machine, essentially one of our, one of our, one of our, um, off the team, one of our colleagues died last year, sadly. And uh, so in his memory, rather than machining it out of aluminum, we're thinking about building it out of something almost as strong that is 3D printed. So this is our draft interstage that we'll be flying this year. It's printed on the Mark Forge technology with nylon and continuous carbon fiber. Um, and the prototypes look really good. Uh, the nice thing is we can print it to the exact size. Um, and uh, so it, the sizing and stability and strength look pretty attractive so far. So um, as you know, this is, uh, uh, we stage roughly around Mach 1 and uh, the sustainer gets up to above Mach 3. And now we're flying on an O3400 to an M685. Uh, so uh, the max stress on this is gonna be during staging, which is kind of just after max, next queue on the, uh, the full stack. So um, pandemic has made it hard, so I need to fly all this stuff. Um, but that's all I have for today. And um, I'm here to answer questions. So um, I'll go to questions now. Uh, I'll go to think oldest questions first. Um, uh, what is my, what is my favorite version of, uh, pet G? I, I happen to like using my Dremel printer a lot and, the, and it, their, their print, um, their print rolls are a little different, a little different size, they're a little more expensive. Um, but when you put the print roll in is RFID, so it automatically, since the printer can do different materials, uh, it automatically sets the printer to the right parameters for that particular material. So I happen to like the uh, Dremel Print G a lot. Um, uh, using nylon or PC, can you make HPR fin cans? I believe you can actually do it with um, pet G and I think you, uh, I think it depends on the size, big, big, if you make big fins in which there's a lot of flexi 
there's a lot of surface area to uh, cause stress, I think that's harder. I think you, as the larger you want to go, you want to move to nylon or particularly the carbon continuous uh, continuous carbon impregnated tin can. Um, that I only that is only uh, available on the Mark Forge printer, I believe. Um, I source the car, the filament with continuous is Mark Forge. It's a proprietary Mark Forged. Uh, um, um, can low cost. One the two hundred dollar printers handle these enhanced filaments. You need to get a slightly better printer. Um, uh, the low cost printers are really stuck with PLA and maybe depending on the features, uh, PET G. Uh, for PET G, you need a heated bed, and you need to get the the nozzle temperature higher. So uh, uh, that almost means that your minimum is going to be roughly around three hundred dollars rather than um, a hundred dollars. Uh, my Dremel printer is, uh, I would call it prosumer. It's now going for $2,000. Uh, I like it because it's multiple materials. It is brain, it self calibrates. I don't have to calibrate the bread, bread, it levels itself. And it has, it's a node on the internet. So in fact, no matter where I am or where my students are, they can submit jobs to be printed on the printer. Um, do you perform any surface cleanup on prints? Um, wonder if you've seen any gains. I have to tell you, I hate paint painting. Uh, and so most of my, uh, my projects are not painted these days because I'm lazy. And so I don't do any surface cleanup. Um, do you find that 3D printed parts weigh considerably more than traditional parts? Uh, it depends what you mean by traditional parts. If you're comparing, say, like, 75 millimeter design I showed you with a six inch fin can, six inch nose cone. That weighs a lot less than a fiberglass nose cone of a similar size. So I think there's issues of scale here um, that are really important. And I think that uh, fin cans, uh, frankly, weigh less than fiberglass slab fins, uh, particularly when overlaid. So I think that it's a uh, it's not a, it's not that simple of an answer. I think this requires a little more design. So I didn't find that. Uh, can you show the workflow slide again? Uh, I think I uploaded a PDF of the presentation. The slide should be there. I have a Creality. Could I do PET G? Uh, it depends which Creality. The higher end Creality's have heated beds and a, um, a higher nozzle temperature. And so you need about a nozzle temperature of about 280 degrees C, and you need a heated bed of about 80 degrees C to be able to print PETG. Have you experimented with lo uh, larger nozzle filament sizes? Not filament sizes, but I am trying with a larger nozzle right now on one of my printers to be able to uh, look, uh, do a better job of printing nylon with embedded carbon fiber. And so I'm experimenting with that right now. Uh, using nylon or PC, can you make HPR fin cans? I believe uh, we can. And um, particularly, even with PETG, I think we can. Uh, there's a, amazing amounts of strength in this. Particularly, uh, I wouldn't go Mach 3 with one of these, but I think we can go Mach 1. I think we'll go Mach 2, actually. How thick a wall do you print on your nose cone? I'm uh, printing uh, two to three millimeters on walls on nose cones. How do you decide how much and what type of shape of infill to use where? I've experimented. Um, I haven't played much with the shape. Uh, most of these designs tend to be thin enough in walls, the amount of infill doesn't matter very much for strength. Um, we're finding that mostly it's continuous, continuous filament. Um, so uh, I have, uh, uh, I generally print most of my nose cones at a very low infill rates on the order of uh, uh, 30%. Um, they seem to work fine um, in terms of the axial strength. Um, 
And for some things, particularly when we go to that last one I showed you, which is we're building the, um, the interstage out of continuous carbon fiber and nylon, uh, that's going to be high infill. It's going to be roughly 80 to 90% infill. Um, let's see. What three? Where's the cost for a 3D printer? The very low end. Uh, if you're going to do just PLA and your projects are like um, not HPR but low power, uh, you can go for anywhere from about hundred to three hundred dollars and get a a, a decent printer. Uh, those tend to require more work in terms of um, your effort in terms of leveling the bed. Uh, I found that the printer at those stages became the hobby, as I said, rather than using as a tool. So I moved to a, a higher end printer. What are your recommendations for optimizing strength and weight for nose cones and transitions? Thick solid wall or thicker wall with thin skins. Um, I'm printing mine also with about six or seven layers of the outer wall for a so far transition. Um, and then the interior at about, depends on the size and speed of the rocket. As I mentioned, our inner stage for um, the the uh, O to M is gonna be 70 or 80%, 80% infill. For lower ones, like the inner, like the inter stage uh, transitions on some of those carrier rockets, uh, that's like 30 or 40% uh, infill. Uh, on nose cones, generally the walls are thin enough that there's no infill. Um, so it's almost entirely just the wall structure. Um, is the fin can tube and fins printed as a single piece? How do you attach the fin can to the fiberglass body tube? Um, depends on size and the size of your printer. So uh, for every button thing but the largest can I printed here, uh, it was printed as one piece. So for the 54 millimeter, 29 millimeter uh, airframes, those are just one single piece. It slides on the airframe. And um, I'm really a fan right now. Of, there's a new, uh, not new to me anyway, uh, uh, a new um, uh, um, epoxy from uh, JB Weld that's a clear epoxy designed for plastics as well as fiberglass. And I've just used that recently and I really like it. There are also some very good CAs that are designed for bonding uh, these things. Um, I can do some, rec if it gets me offline, I'll, I'll give you some details. But I highly recommend this JB Weld. Um, in the largest design I've done on this printer uh, for that 75 millimeter design, I had to print it in two pieces. so. I designed it as one piece, took it in a tinker CAD, split it in half, added some binding along the edges so that they there was kind of sawtooth, so they intersected, printed each half, um, and then JB welded each side onto the fiberglass airframe. It's looking really strong. I haven't flown it yet, but it looks like it should do really well. Um, bonding of most of things like PETG and nylon to... Um, Fiberglass, there's some really good adhesives for that. Again, I recommend this JB Weld Clear, and uh, that'd be the one I'd use right now. Since this is for high power applications where there are likely to be significant stresses put on the part, do you use any special printer settings to ensure above average layer adhesion? I do not. I haven't found that with my printer, but then again, I'm liking my printer a lot. It seems to do really well, particularly with Dremel uh, filament, uh, that I don't find a problem with layer adhesion. It does very well in the first layer uh, because it does a self-alignment, so the self -la first layer is almost always good. And then uh, the, the quality of the filament seems to be a bit higher than I've seen in third-party filaments. And so uh, layer adhesion seems to be very, very good. And the prototypes we've gotten for the inner stage on the Mark Forge printer are even better. I mean, the uh, I, the Mark Forge printer is a four to five thousand dollar device, uh, and I'm not quite ready to leap for that, particularly since I have a friend that has one. Um, but uh, it look the quality of the print that comes out is really astonishing. Um, so, uh, 
How do you deal? Does ABS have better temperature support and less weight? What are some of the downsides? Um, I haven't used ABS, frankly, very much. I tried it, but ABS is is has toxic properties. It's hard to just. It doesn't really uh, biodegrade. And I've discovered that if you look, uh, there's a chart I I believe I put in the presentation that is um, uh, about the qualities of PETG and particularly uh, uh, PLA plus, which is an enhanced PLA, it comes on different names. On um, the Dremel, it come, it's called Eco ABS because it's biodegradable. Um, these are equal to uh, uh, PETG and PLA plus, and then even nylon have better properties than ABS, and I think better strength. Um, so I prefer dramatically not using ABS. How do you deal with support for say fins in a fin can with pet G? Just live with supports. I like supports. Uh, I put more supports in. Um, and one of the properties I like in Simplify 3D, my slicer is that I can customize the supports. The supports give me less finishing because they can give a smoother outline to edges that are. So for those of you who haven't done printing, if you have like a cantilever of a fin coming out like this, um, if you don't have supports underneath the fin as it's printing, the, the material will drip off and you'll get a bad edge. So for things like that are overly cantilever like this, you need to be able to you, you print in higher, lower density supports underneath it to be able to have a clean edge. Um, so I like prints a lot. Uh, I do that in every... It's particular. I found uh, support's really important with nylon, actually, because nylon tends to be stringy, and so without supports, nylon doesn't work very well at all. Um, let's see. Um, any recommendations for printers that are a little more affordable than prosumer? Um, I would look for the things I would look for in a good printer are um, make sure you have a heated bed that can go up to about 100 degrees C. Um, look for a nozzle temperature approaching 300 degrees C. I found that the problem with low end printers is that they didn't have self aligning beds so that the beds would get a little uh, out of level because they're, they're actually mounted on springs so that. Um, with an out of level bed, you, you do not get a good first layer print and you don't get significant layers that, that are attached and you don't get good layer adhesion. So it's really important to be able to, um, to get that layer adhesion to have a bed that's leveled. Um, so those three pieces would be the most important pieces I would think that I would look at. Um, have you had any issues with petchy layer separation? Uh, not yet, but my sample size is small. Uh, let's talk to me in, in a year from now and we'll know more. Um, would you go into a little more detail on the plus and minuses of each of the printer materials? What makes PETG a good choice? Um, without bringing the slide back up, um, I think the uh, the differences are really um, uh, what 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 is the strength in various directions? Um, what is the rigidity, um, uh, and then what is the flexibility, and then what is the temperature? Um, what is the uh, plastic deformation temperature? So, if we're going to be flying high speed, particularly transonic, we need uh, strength that gets us through max Q, and um, and a temperature that won't melt, that won't melt. Um, uh, PLA, let's say use PLA, which is the simplest thing we see uh, in low end printers. Uh, and you use that for a motor retainer, it will melt. The, the temperature of the, burnt, of the motor, particularly of a reusable motor, uh, will, melt the, will melt the PLA. So probably you melt the PLA. So when you get to temperatures of PETG and uh, enhanced PLA and 
particularly nylon, which is about up in the 200s, um, we get temperatures that are stronger, are, are uh, less temperature deformation than the epoxy resin. We get strength that begins to rival um, uh, thin fiberglass. Um, I particularly like PETG over uh, PLA or ABS because it has a bit of flexibility. And, um, uh, and that gives us, I think, a bit more robustness. Uh, you can bend a little bit without breaking. And I think that that is really important in transonic flight. And I think it's even more important in recovery. So if, if, it, if it lands, you don't want your fins breaking. So you, I like that robustness, particularly in PETG and nylon. Um, would like a little more info, bumper sticker level, at the goals of the various projects, events you mentioned. Um, so I build two kinds of rockets. One is high performance. I prefer altitude over speed. So I prefer long burn motors because um, the last place you want to go fast is in the low atmosphere where drag is highest. So you'd rather uh, be able to extend your burn to minimize your exposure to high atmosphere density. So I like um, uh, high performance rockets for altitude with long burn motors. And so um, uh, those are for my own uh, particularly satisfaction. The, the other events that I'm trying to uh, look at is TARP. Uh, this is not really HPR, but um, almost every, all the parts except the cardboard airframes and the motors and the avionics can be built uh, out, of pet, out, of, um, uh, out of 3D printing. And my teams are all doing that. And they're all designing their own nose cones, designing their own transitions, designing their own fin cans, learning a bit about avionics, probably about aerodynamics, so that they... Um, uh, one of the challenges I find in TARC, for example, is that um, the most expense I find that teams need to fly 10 to 20 times before they qualify. And uh, that gets expensive. That's hundreds of dollars. And um, raising money, uh, unless your parents are totally funding you, is a challenge with many, with many schools. So if we can cut the cost of the motors in half, uh, that makes it much more accessible to many more teams. And it turns out if you make your, your rocket aerodynamic, it'll go just as high with a smaller motor. And if you have you do that intentionally, and 3D printing really enables you to do that, uh, you can save a lot of money and uh, get more teams. So TARC is for high school students that are uh, putting eggs up to about 800 feet. Uh, SLI is Student Launch Initiative by NASA, which is uh, a, uh, an application mostly for university teams to fly um, projects uh, monitored by NASA Marshall. Um, and generally it's an HPR, generally from K to M, flying to 5,000 feet, flying a payload uh, designated by NASA engineers. And that projects, those teams start in uh, September and go through and fly in May. And there's a process of structured process, NASA process of PDRs and CDRs and design reviews and documentation to go through. Uh, SA Cup is Spaceport America Cup, which is now become dramatically successful. Uh, it's now really worked by no, both TRA and by uh, NAR. And um, I'm a mentor and judge, and uh, we fly Spaceport America in, in um, uh, New Mexico. We didn't fly last year. We had to be able to do a virtual event this year. I think the intention is hopefully to fly. And uh, there's two competitions, really. <clears throat> There's a 10,000 foot competition in which you fly a CubeSat, to your CubeSat to uh, 10,000 feet. And there's a competition in which you design a rocket to fly that same to you uh, CubeSat to 30,000 feet. And so we get about, I think it's 150 teams around the world. So it's international competition. Um, very impressive. Our list is a rocket launch for international student satellites. It's about 20 years old. We founded it in 1999. Uh, my mentor, Bob Twiggs, Professor Bob Twiggs, the inventor of CubeSats, the inventor of CanSats, uh, was the founder. And it's also an international competition. We have about 50 teams here a year. And it's not about rockets. It's about flying satellites. And so some of us well, amateurs build um, standard rockets. We've built roughly for the last uh, uh, 20 years. 
and uh, we fly a student payload, which is a roughly a one kilogram autonomous payload. We fly it to about 10,000 feet, we throw it out. Uh, it then has to come back to a set of GPS coordinates autonomously on the desert playa, it either sprouts wings, it's a glider, or it drops the playa on a parachute and crawls back on wheels. Um, or quadcopters are increasingly uh, fascinating right now. Uh, basically, it's building um, satellites and robots. Um, I think those are the major ones. Um, do you perform any of the mechanical testing on the parts you print? And if so, how do you go about testing parts before flying? I use my hands. Uh, you know, one of these impressively amazing jigs, you know. Um, I guess I, I feel I have enough experience right now that I can have a good idea about um, how good that is. And so that has worked well for me so far. We'll see if that continues to be true. Um, what kind of temperatures were you seeing in the tip of the nose going? I haven't flown that project yet, so I don't know. But the part that bothers me is I don't know anybody else who knows it either. Uh, so I don't think, you know, in all the years of doing this stuff, no one has ever flown one. So maybe the first one flown. If you know of one, please tell me. I, I really would like to know. Uh, do you have any experience with Prusa printers? I do not, though I just ordered one. Uh, so I, it's the Prusa printer is promising because it's $1,000 rather than $2,000. It seems to have the same capabilities as my Dremel printers. And um, in the sense that it does most of the critical pieces I mentioned of nozzle temperature and heated bed and leveling. So I'm, 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 we'll see. The biggest deal is a larger print bed. So I'm enthusiastic about getting a larger print bed. Uh, does PLA plus equal tough PLA? Maybe, uh, the branding on this PLA stuff, PLA plus, eco ABS, enhanced PLA, tough PLA, is a, a, a tough branding exercise? Uh, I don't know, but I, my guess is yes. You'd have to look in details of the print specifications of the filament. Okay, I think I've gone through all the questions. Uh, if there's, thank you very much for uh, attending. I appreciate the attention and um, I'll be giving another presentation in a few hours that includes some of this material, but also looks at advanced electronics, which I'm also very fascinated with. And because one of the things I'm fascinated with is building satellites. And so the electronics we have today in building things is really quite amazing. And so I think that for us as amateurs, we have great tools in terms of 3D printing and amazing electronics that allow us to build uh, impossible things. So thank you all for joining me. Um, Wait a minute, there's more printers. Ah. Nope, ah, open question. Uh, great job, thanks. Um, use 1D gas equations to get the attack at the nose cone tip. Um, I guess I'm pragmatic. I wanna see someone measure that, um, you know, and justify what the temperature is. Uh, and uh, I, you know, you know, we used to fly plastic nose cones. I still do, uh, supersonic. So I think there's a question of uh, we live. The hobby, sadly, is not as scientific as I'd like. I'd like us to bring more science to it, more documentation, more rigor, and uh, without losing having the fun of uh, being a hobby. But I'm a geek. I like data. Uh, all right. Thank you all and have a great day. I'm stopping.